The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. is Policy Watch with Doug Fesher. The number of federally registered lobbyists in the United States is growing substantially as the industry continues to develop. They maintain a heavy influence in public policy decisions and play a fundamental role in our society. Today we discuss the world of lobbying and its economic role in Washington, D.C. with Jeffrey Birnbaum, award-winning author and columnist for The Washington Post. And now, the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besheron. Jeff Birnbaum, welcome to Policy Watch. Thank you for having me. We're delighted. Uh, you write a column for the Washington Post that's called In the Loop on K Street. And uh, you also wrote a book called Showdown at Gucci Gulch. Mm -hmm. What is Gucci Gulch? Uh, I wrote that book uh, with Alan Murray years ago. Uh, it's about the Tax Reform Act of 1986, and uh, uh, Gucci Gulch is the hallway outside of the tax writing committees on Capitol Hill, where uh, Bob Dole once said, uh, after a late night session, uh, pointing to the lobbyists out in the hallway, they're Gucci to Gucci in the hallway. <laughs> and so uh, it, uh, the, where outside of the tax writing committees where a lot of lobbying is done is called Gucci Gulch. Now, Lobbyists have been in the news a great deal uh, these days, but people have run for president picking on lobbyists for a long time, uh, as early as Woodrow Wilson? That's right. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was the first, uh, I think, to institutionalize the uh, vilification of lobbyists. Uh, he had the tools to do it uh, because at Princeton, where he was a professor, uh, factional politics was one of his uh, scholarly, scholarly uh, uh, pursuits. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he wrote uh, a lot about lobbying and special interests and the breakdown of the committee system in Congress uh, because of it. Uh, and when he ran for president in 1912, he uh, decided uh, that a perfect way to show that he uh, supported uh, the public view as opposed to the narrow interest that he would attack uh, uh, the object of his expertise, uh, lobbyists, mostly corporate lobbyists. Railroad, uh, oil? Oil, yeah, um, a variety of those kind. And uh, over the years, uh, that pattern has been repeated by many a successful and unsuccessful presidential candidate. It's a, it's a four-year tradition now. But it almost seems bigger or worse now. Uh, uh, Barack Obama is running on a promise to have nothing to do with lobbyists, and McCain is somewhat embarrassed. I'm exaggerating a little right. bit. Right, it's, it's a little bit more nuanced than that, but you are correct that uh, I, I don't recall uh, in my own experience in Washington nor reading about any uh, presidential campaign that was so uh, targeted uh, on lobbyists and the problems that they create by both uh, candidates running for president. and. Uh, um, there are some nuances involved. Barack Obama uh, attacks federally registered lobbyists. Uh, so that, that, that allows him to take money from lawyers. From lawyers, from uh, state registered lobbyists and their spouses and uh, families. Um, uh, John McCain is uh, mostly focused on uh, special interests, though he has banished from his campaign any currently federally registered lobbyists. Um, uh, but there's no question that... Um, in the wake of a, a long series now of lobbying scandals, uh, mostly on Capitol Hill, uh, that uh, the hatred of Washington as it now, uh, as people now see it, is really personified in lobbyists, and it is a very, very convenient um, a tool that politicians are using to say, I want something different than what's going on in Washington. Not only do I support uh, the public interest, uh, but I specifically don't like those lobbyists because they're out to prevent you from getting what you want. Whether that's true or not, I hope we can discuss yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And um, Hillary Clinton 
early in the primary season tried to defend lobbyists and said there's some very fine ones. Yes. But that didn't have any traction. No. Um, in the wake of Jack Abramoff, uh, which uh, my colleagues at the uh, Post won a Pulitzer Prize for uh, unveiling, he was, he was a lobbyist, but uh, he was uh, shown to be actually a thief, uh, taking money from uh, uh, Indian tribes and not providing services to them, he and his colleagues, or at least that's the allegation. Uh, then we've gone through earmarking uh, uh, scandals, which are narrow projects that uh, lobbyists help uh, slip into legislation, including the uh, very infamous uh, Bridge to Nowhere, uh, a more than $200 million bridge. Now, be careful. My university has a lobbyist as well. Oh, well, uh, Will, I, I don't mean... I'm trying to explain why l lobbyists have been elevated to this low level. Does that make any sense? Yes. <laughs> but, but it is that combination uh, that have, has uh, made them impossible now, I think, to defend in uh, presidential rhetoric. Uh, but as... Uh, uh, as, as one lobbyist I recently uh, quoted, uh, her name is uh, Sister Simone Campbell. As a, she's actually a, uh, a Roman Catholic uh, nun. Uh, uh, politics, as she said, is um, are, car is car are cartoon books, uh, coloring books, and uh, the actual details uh, often miss the notice of. Uh, the voters who are listening to the presidential candidates, and that is, I think, exactly the correct description of why people dislike lobbyists so much, and at the same time, why they are so integral to the system uh, as it exists now and will continue to exist. Have I read your, as I read your columns, though, I kept thinking, you know, it feels as if there are more lobbyists today than 10 years ago, than 15 years ago, and it's not just that the economy is larger. It feels as if something's changed. Well, uh, there are more federal, uh, federally registered lobbyists. Those are the people who actually spend their time uh, preparing or going up to Capitol Hill or going uh, in to talk directly uh, to members of Congress and their staffs. Um, that's true. That number has grown substantially, uh, doubled maybe in the last six, seven years or so, uh, though that does fluctuate. What's really grown is the uh, size of the influence industry, as I like to think of it. It's a multi-billion dollar industry that involves many different kinds of, uh, of professionals, uh, public relations people who try to get uh, people like me to write stories about their side, um, advertising experts. A lot of, uh, of, of lobbying is now trying to get actual voters to express what the lobbyists in Washington want. And so um, either through advertising or uh, grassroots lobbying, which is contacting voters uh, to who in turn contact members of Congress. I like to th think of it as astroturf lobbying rather than grassroots because of its <laughs> artificial nature. But um, uh, uh, there are many, many different kinds of lobbies, and uh, downtown Washington has grown hugely as a result of the money pouring in to the influence industry because so much is at stake. Um, we have a very activist government that itself has gotten very, very large, and so that's why, uh, and, and, and small changes, even on the margin of legislation, uh, can produce very big results, and so there's a lot of money out there for, for lobbyists. We discussed earlier, would you mind? Uh, no, no, no. Oh, thank you. Uh, the, the, the economics of lobbying, so that uh, it might be clear, there is a lobbying firm in town that annually uh, tries to assess how um, much value it provides to its clients. And uh, for several years running now, uh, it has uh, judged how much it receives in fees compared to how much it gets for its clients, either in direct benefits or uh, pain avoided, which is in a very Washington way is a very good assessment. And by their judgment, uh, it was for every $1 of fees, they uh, returned $100 of benefit or pain avoided. Now, I don't know about you. It's a bargain. If, if I uh, had that kind of investment return, I would certainly take it. And that is why money keeps flowing into uh, the influence industry. Uh, you started to mention, the in, you call it the influence industry, and you talked about all the different things. These are, in some respects, coalitions of, group, of, of lobbyists, right? They, each one doing something different. Let, let's talk not so much about a, um, 
a, a business-oriented lobby, but if you could, w either naming names or not, a pu what they call a public interest lobby, whether it's the environment or whatever. Well, I think what you're alluding to is the, just as lobbyists are seen as, uh, I guess, caricatured as uh, fat, cigar-smoking men who shove $100 bills into the pockets of compliant lawmakers. Now, there are some people who fit that description, and they are fun to have lunch with if you have the chance, and I recommend it. Uh, but there are very few of those. The days when there is one person who could call one person and get something done um, is really long gone. That's and partly because there's no longer the one person to make something happen. That's exactly right. Uh, because uh, of a much more democratized Congress uh, with diffuse power centers, uh, especially including staff. Staff are very important. Most people think that lobbying is done at the lawmaker level, and it is sometimes, but staff really know where the details are, and that's really where lobbying focuses. Uh, and it's not just one person. It is a whole collection of uh, professions who work in cooperation with each other. Lots of different organizations form uh, coalitions of like-minded, uh, whether it's a, uh, something as narrow as a fee on, on uh, credit cards, uh, the uh, retailers want those fees to be low. The banks that provide uh, the, those, the credit cards want them to stay where they are, and each of them form coalitions, and they hire each. They, 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 there are several different banking groups and several different retailer groups, the uh, dry goods and the grocers, and each of them hire a whole set of lobbying experts. They raise money. Uh, they uh, they, they give money uh, through their political action committees. They have access lobbyists, each of them, from, uh, from taken from their groups. They hire public relations experts. They hire grassroots experts. They buy advertising. And there is an entire campaign, usually on both sides of an issue. That's the face of modern lobbying. That's what lobbying is about. A, 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 an increasingly small portion, does that make sense, is of actually the access lobbying of the, in other words, registered lobbyists that are being vilified, and a, a lot more of it is directed back home to actual voters, uh, often through the Internet. Electronic lobbying is very important, setting up of websites uh, which uh, and, uh, allow email to be directed to uh, specific uh, uh, important members' offices and, and committees. These things, no matter what the presidential candidates say, are very important and will grow, uh, in part because no one is thinking of doing away with them, but also because um, there's so much at stake um, and lobbying is protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, which Explicitly. Is, Right, the right to petition for redress of grievances um, goes back to the Magna Carta. And now it's elaborated in this way, in a way that you don't hear expressed on the campaign trail, of course, but it is a fundamental part of, of Washington. Well, I think many people would say, sure, when um, uh, the Sierra Club wants to lobby, or sure, when the National Cancer Society or the right to life or the abortion rights group wants to, and those are of course groups that are most hostile to some of the, the anti-lobbying rules. But what about business? Should we be worried that business is mounting these kinds of campaigns against the common good? Uh, I, I try to be agnostic on this question. I, I write about lobbying uh, as a profession and uh, the only way to continue to do so is to give all sides uh, a, 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 its fair shake, and I think it, it does make sense to do so. So I, uh, the Sierra Club is as much a lobbyist as is the American Petroleum Institute, which represents the oil and gas industry. They use very much the same techniques. They often are fighting with each other, and you may agree with one and disagree with the other, but I know it's, it's hard for especially people on the East Coast in urban settings like this one uh, to imagine, but there are plenty of people who really think the American Petroleum Institute is right on a lot of issues. And I, as a, a journalist, um, have to uh, 
I want to be able to reflect that. Uh, at the same time, I, I am not uh, blind to the fact that uh, at $4 a gallon uh, gasoline, not many people really like the American Petroleum Institute, certainly not as many who used to. Some of the most effective lobbying is education, whether it's of staff or the public, right? Most of the information that lawmakers and other decision makers in, in Washington use to set policy and implement laws come from lobbyists and lobbying groups. Um, and why is that? Because they're the best sources of, of that information. There's, in some cases, there's no better source of information. In part, the hollowing out of government, which uh, is, uh, has been chronicled by scholars, uh, many of your colleagues, um, it means that uh, the government is much more reliant on data from lobbying groups. And if you want to know about the mining industry, um, you should call the, uh, the Mining Association. And they really do have a lot of information. Um, and, so and they know that they can't um, exaggerate or give inaccurate information because next time, I don't want to get too carried away here, but because next time, if they're caught, they'll lose their credibility. So they have an incentive to be relatively accurate in the information they yes, give. They, uh, yes. And that's, uh, most people would never imagine that accuracy and lobbyists could be spoken in the same uh, a sentence, but that is exactly the case. Um, the best lobbyists, the most effective lobbyists, are the uh, people who can accurately and succinctly give both sides to any argument, their own side and what the other side will provide. Uh, and the way a lot of legislation is put together, basically, is where members of Congress and their staffs sit as judges listening to the uh, two sides as presented by lobbying groups. Now, you mentioned earmarks, and I must say, from a distance, they seem more unsavory. I hear cases where a particular member inserts a clause for spending or something that has nothing to do with that member's district. And I say, why did this member care about this? I, I, I think that earmarking... Um, which has amounted in some years to tens of billions of dollars. I've seen an estimate uh, for 2004 of $55 billion. Yeah, I think that's a little high, um, although I think you saw it in one of my columns, truth be told. Yes. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't tell my editors. I hope no one's watching. Uh, so, uh, no, but it's at least $20 billion in recent years, and um, it depends how you define earmarks. And a lot of earmarking, I think, has been... Uh, it, most people consider it to be excessive because it is a, a f form of pure patronage, basically. Because you are more senior, or you're right on the right committee, and you can, you do get more money for yourself. But uh, um, and, and there, there's been a whole cottage industry that's grown up um, where um, lobbyists simply follow the paperwork through f uh, for their patrons, uh, the members of Congress, basically. Uh, and, and provide everything that the members of Congress who can uh, have the power to insert earmarks do, whether it was travel, which has now been uh, shut down thanks to recent lobbying reforms, uh, but providing campaign uh, funds, raising money. Um, it, it, it becomes a very insular, very inside the beltway uh, issue. And it, it is because it, it has, it started small but grew so large uh, that it, it clearly uh, has outgrown its usefulness. And it can be very useful. I mean, if you got an earmark uh, of a new traffic light down the street from you so that there would be fewer accidents at an intersection, that would seem like a very useful earmark. Actually, I want to argue with you about that. Go ahead. So we have an intersection around here, mm -hmm. and the local community has been trying to get a traffic light there. Mm -hmm. And the highway department has a rule you have to have X number of accidents at a corner before you get a traffic light. But we got a traffic light because somebody made a donation to somebody and therefore had access to somebody to go beyond the rule. Now, I guess I really want to challenge you on this because I see this happening in funding decisions mm -hmm. that would never get through the regular governmental channels. Right. And this looks like a serious cost to the way governments op should operate. I, I don't want to be... Uh, uh, 
put into the position of defending earmarks. Uh, but I do, uh, as, as an effective lobbyist might, I can give you the argument on the other side. Um, though I am not a lobbyist, I should point out. Uh, I, who better, who would know better the neighborhood, the uh, locale, than a member of Congress who drives uh, through your intersection and knows it to be a, uh, a dangerous intersection and w without much difficulty can make sure that the dangerous intersection is protected um, and so that some lives would be saved. That would be the argument. And I, I think it is a reasonable argument, but it can go too far uh, and obviously has gone too far with the Bridge to Nowhere. Uh, I knew there was real trouble when the Bridge to Nowhere appeared on the cover of Parade magazine. That's a leading indicator of, of political trouble uh, upcoming. Um, but uh, because the backscratching part of, of earmarking, that is uh, a powerful um, member of the Appropriations Committee has former staffers out there doing nothing but arranging for earmarks for him or her um, and getting very large sums of money directed to one district over another. You have to wonder whether that's a matter of protecting the folks back home or uh, gorging yourself. Feeding something. Um, I don't think this was in one of your columns, but I read that the starting salary for one of these um, revolving door people, leaves the Congress and goes to lobbyists, $300,000 a year. It was, it was in one of my stories, yes. Um, I, I, I ruined the Sunday for many, many people uh, uh, with that Let fact. me say, most of us who teach at the University of Maryland wondered why we were teaching. This, were, this, this, is, uh, this is not your average starting salary, so you know. This was senior members uh, of the staffs leadership staffs, the heads, uh, the chief counsels of important committees, when going downtown, which is a euphemism for becoming a lobbyist, could start at, I think it was 325000 a few years ago. Uh, on, that was a, a going rate then. Yes. And let's complete the loop. Uh, for those of us outside of this world, it looks as if one of the reasons the lobbyists have access to the members is not just that they were former staffers, but because they do make campaign contributions, they help in campaign fundraising, so they are part of a general apparatus. Have, have I got that wrong? No, you have that right, but it's even more than that. Uh, the reason you hire uh, uh, the former chief counsel of the House Ways and Means Committee, which is the tax writing and trade committee in the House, is not just for access to his or her uh, former boss, but for the knowledge of how the committee works um, a, a deep knowledge of very, very complicated policies. So uh, it, it, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Lobbyists are experts, not just the access lobbyists, but um, health care um, um, in particular, which will be a very big issue upcoming, is just uh, your eyes will cross it so uh, mind-numbingly difficult to understand. And there aren't many people who understand the politics and the substance. And if you find somebody who is, and, and it happens to be people who have worked on the staffs in Congress for a long time, that person is actually extremely valuable. That's, those people aren't paid that amount of money uh, uh, simply because um, uh, the folks downtown are being nice to them. It, because they can actually bring into a firm a multiple of that amount uh, from fees of, of uh, corporations for the most part uh, that really need that expertise. Um, we only have a few minutes left. Let me go back to the place of lobbyists or the non-place of lobbyists in the presidential campaigns. And I wonder whether it's accurate to think that one of the reasons that has more traction today or is a more of a story is because lobbyists and the lobbying world have become more integral to the governing process, just as you've described, so that it's quite difficult to find someone who knows about health care reform, for example, right. who hasn't interacted on these kinds of issues. I think that's right. <clears throat> um, lobbyists are the people who live here, uh, who uh, know uh, who you have to talk to and how you have to talk about certain things and know which things not to talk about. My real 
to the, to the extent I, because I write a column, I could say this just, it's a little bit more of an opinion. But it is, in, it has been in my experience, I covered the Clinton White House when it first arrived. Wrote and, a wonderful book called Madhouse. So, thank you. Well, my wife thanks you for mentioning that. Uh, unless you know who to talk to, where the pitfalls are, unless you know uh, which interests to, um, uh, to favor and which ones you can afford to turn your back on, the chances of getting things done in Washington are much diminished. And so if either John McCain or Barack Obama come to Washington and really uh, refuse to talk to the people who are expert in, in, in the lay of the land on the way interest groups interact in Washington, I think their chances of actually succeeding, getting legislation that they want, is, are, will, would be much diminished. Un un unless they turn to us university professors. Right. Well, we've about run out of time. It's, uh, it's been a wonderful conversation. Jeff Birnbaum, thank you very much. Thank you. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.